Okay, today is some review that, of things that you uh, should know, perhaps, if you were paying attention uh, in class at earlier, um, math classes in particular. I want to show you some really neat stuff about complex variables, their series, the fields that they make, also coordinate systems, which is the next topic here, is the GCC coordinate systems that uh, make Lagrangian, Hamiltonian, Jacobian, all that mechanics possible. So I want to uh, answer a question, what good are complex functions in general, but in particular the exponentials that make all of this uh, possible? And I've listed here, um, well, first off, five things that have uh, that make complex arithmetic uh, interesting, but then as far as complex functions and the calculus goes, uh, there are uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 through 16 uh, very different things, but all connected, uh, that make uh, it useful uh, to use complex numbers. You've probably noticed that quantum mechanics just starts off using complex numbers without explaining why. And that part of that explanation uh, should be forthcoming. In any case, uh, as I say, we're going to go very quickly through uh, this just to review uh, how your vector analysis is improved. But in particular, the calculus of vector analysis uh, is um, the, I think, really interesting part of this. And this is something I wouldn't have discovered if I didn't have access to uh, the Macintosh computer particular. Now, unfortunately, there are no links up here for the up-to-date up uh, application that we're going to be uh, playing with a uh, Macintosh uh, application. Uh, you're welcome uh, in this class to uh, take advantage of some of our loaners if you want to uh, participate in this particular one. But I hope that before too long we'll be having a, the pro program called Analyt uh, on the web. And um, I think it really deserves to be there and uh, take time. In any case, I want to point out also that this lecture comes in two parts at least. The uh, part that uh, uh, last time this was given uh, started uh, right here uh, in the uh, vector field uh, potential theory uh, section. Uh, if we go fairly quickly through the arithmetic, uh, we can go a little bit further. Uh, on this today. So I'm hoping uh, to get to the, this part right here uh, that has to do with what we call analyticity. You've heard that word in the high energy physics and things like that. Well, we're going to do the very basic uh, understanding of, of that. So uh, let me uh, begin uh, by talking about money. The exponential that I'm interested in here is the one that would come if you were to uh, take uh, the old practice of interest, which is uh, often regarded as a very sinful thing, and maybe it is, but in any case, the uh, idea was that uh, only certain people, and it was the Jewish people, uh, could loan money and, uh, and thereby profit. Uh, the, this is in, in the Renaissance period of Italy that I'm uh, talking about. It was until later that the Medicis came on and they realized that they were losing out if they didn't get involved in this. Now, idea simple. You give a principal to a bank and at some time later they pay you uh, the original amount plus some interest rate times the time that they loaned it to you. So uh, I'm taking a very simple example here with 100% uh, interest. Uh, just like uh, what I experienced when I spent a year in Brazil, but also Israel has had 100% several times. Things have stabilized in both those countries, I think, for now. But it's interesting just to uh, explore this function and see it in some detail. In this case, it's very simple. With 100% interest, I get $1 and $1 of interest, which is 2. And let's just uh, see what happens if you uh, generalize this. If you Fix it so that at the six month point, you do the same thing that we just did. Uh, 
but then go on to the full year and do it again, uh, you find that you have uh, uh, applied this 1 plus r times interest for half a month to some principal that is already gained from uh, being uh, uh, paid off at the six month point. And so you get a product of this 1 plus r times t over 2 twice. That's 3 halves, 3 halves, 9 fourths, that's $2.25. And then if you generalize to a third period, a quarter period, and so forth, a finer and finer periods, you can see here that if I do it at the four month uh, period, that is one third of a year, that I earn more than $2 or $2.25, I earn $2.37. And it looks like if I were to continue uh, letting people compound, uh, say, infinitely often, and imagining a, a capitalist there, a greedy capitalist with his cigar and his dollar signs, uh, with a little bow tie that represents uh, infinite interest, what would uh, uh, you get if you did this, you see? And he's thinking, wow, I'd get a lot of money if I, if I could invest at that thing. But the answer is not. As you can see, uh, here, where I've gone one half, one third, one fourth by one fourth, I'm only picking up an extra seven cents, unlike the 25 cents I picked up from going from simple to uh, half compound. And what I'd like you to see is how that function uh, varies, and uh, in particular, if it's, it's something that we want to use to calculate this infinite interest function, and you can see the uh, uh, numbers here. Uh, here we got two dollars and forty-four cents, and if I go for once a month, I got two two dollars and sixty-one cents in change, and uh, so forth. Sixty-nine, seventy-one. Now the ones I've written here in uh, bold-faced green are numbers that are not going to change as I make the period larger. Here's daily. This was weekly. They gave it two sixty-nine, but daily already three digits of that are never going to change. So from here on out, after daily compounding, I, if I round off, I'm not going to see any improvement uh, uh, to speak of in my thing. I might get one more penny out of uh, doing this thing hourly or secondly or every microsecond or every nanosecond. That's what I'd like to, you to see is how that uh, behaves because uh, that is the uh, exponential uh, at work here. So what we're doing here is we're imagining a mf, an m compounding uh, function. And uh, here we are for m equal a thousand. Okay, we do a thousand every every uh, interest period. And then ten thousand, you see, then a hundred thousand, then a million, then ten million, a hundred million, a billion even, okay. Finally, by a billion, all of the numbers in an ordinary calculate, calculated with nine-figure uh, precision are fixed. So you're getting exactly the value of this marvelous constant called E, the exponential constant of uh, Napier and uh, Euler. Euler uh, gets his first letter on this, uh, on, on this function. So uh, this is the idea of a function that you if you study calculus, they show this, but I, I wanted to put a monetary uh, swing to it to get your attention a little better, but also uh, to be aware uh, uh, that it's actually happening in banking right now. In, in, in banking now, you can get infinite interest, and uh, they're happy to give it to you. So uh, the idea of uh, saying uh, here, if I, if I rewrite this little mr here, uh, if I write rt over n instead of 1 over m, then I've got a time function here that uh, where, uh, where you just have rate times time in the exponent. That's what we're going to look at, is that uh, function. That's what's going to make all of the complex variable stuff possible. So this is really an important piece of mathematics that occurred quite a bit before uh, the uh, Euler theorems and uh, DeMond theorems that we're going to uh, show very quickly here. Anyway, this is a terrible way uh, to get the number. 
I have to multiply over a hundred million times to get this uh, nine-figure uh, precision. It's got to be a better way. And that better way comes from expanding the binomial that defines the exponential. So here's the binomial uh, expansion, the binomial theorem, if you will. And here's the one that we want to apply it to. You see. So uh, remember what a factorial is. Uh, one factorial 3, 1 times 2 times 3, but also remember that 0 factorial is defined as 1, just like 1 factorial, but all the other numbers are just sequential products of their factors. That uh, is going to be uh, simplified here as we let n go to infinity. If we let n go to infinity, then all of these things here that were complicated, that is the um, mul multinomials, become just simple powers. That is, if, we can, if, if we're talking about a really large n, or m, then I can ignore uh, all of the extra terms except for the highest power. And doing that leads us to uh, a series that you know and love, the Taylor series or McLaurin series, uh, for the exponential function. So now, you see, as I get, start to use this, uh, I really only need a small number of arithmetic steps. R roughly uh, here I am getting uh, a precision uh, just with a series of eight uh, terms. Now there involves some extra multiplication here we, uh, we're just um, multiplying, but here I'm adding and doing some simple multiplications and already getting three-figure accuracy. In order to get three-figure accuracy, I had to do 10,000 products, you see. And here I don't have to do anywhere near uh, that many uh, arithmetic steps, okay? So, uh, six-figure precision comes a lot sooner than it does up there, and so forth, as we go to higher numbers. Now, uh, one of the things that I think is important is to see that all functions have a series like that, and that's of course part of the calculus to learn about that. But I want to make a connection with the mechanics that we're doing while we're at it. This will be a small amount of mechanics in this particular lecture uh, that uh, I think you ought to see. And that is uh, just the definition of derivatives. So if I uh, take the first derivative of some power series like this, and uh, immediately lose the initial constant, uh, then it's only these constants, 1 through n, that I need uh, uh, to uh, define the velocity. And same with the acceleration. This time I'm going to lose this constant right here in that derivative, and then only involve the coefficients with 2, 3, and 4, you say. So these are uh, just the derivation of the Maclaurin series, actually. It's a Taylor series around origin. And of course, NASA lets you uh, use fancy name, funny name, funny, uh -huh, jerk, for uh, uh, the change in acceleration. And then I got funny and said I would be silly like NASA, and I'll call change of jerk uh, inauguration. And I apologize that before because I don't think our president is a jerk. But we may <laughs> be changing him in for a jerk if uh, Donald Trump man, makes it through the scenes. So anyway, um, this is a Maclaurin series for any function for which uh, its derivatives and value uh, are definable at origin. And then it's easy to generalize that to make a series around it. Now, one of the things I want to do before uh, these two lectures are over is quench you with a generalization of this series for complex numbers. And that series allows you to not just use positive powers, but to also have uh, a small number usually, but it's possible to have an infinite number of negative powers as well. So uh, we'll be do, uh, doing some more with this as we consider complex functions and numbers. But that won't come today. Uh, that's very much the end of this two-lecture series. In any case, I want you to remind you that mechanics is, is right here as far as sophomore physics goes, pretty much. The good old university physics one 
uh, formula for position is your initial position plus your initial velocity times time plus one half over, over two factorial, which is one half, uh, the acceleration if it's constant. And in other words, if you maintain that constant. But the idea is that any function, however uh, wiggly, as long as it isn't discontinuous in any of its uh, values or derivatives, uh, could be defined for all time by extending this. That's a little bit unnerving. The idea is that all the information about a function for its whole expanse is contained, and if you take a microscope and look very closely at some point that you call origin. It's, you know, just a, that's, a, that's a little bit of a, of a squeeze for your brain to think of that, you say. And so with a microscope, you can predict the future. Well, nobody's been able to do it yet, but you can certainly think about it, and you can write equations like this that look like that's what's going on. And also, setting all of these initial values equal to 1, and this would be true for any point on the exponential, that will give you, in this case if we're talking about the actual time equals 0, the exponential series that we uh, were talking about before. Okay, so th these are some of the uh, wonderful mathematical things that you often are brush over in uh, a course. And one of the things I would make sure you see is the geometry of this of this relation in particular, but uh, also I'd like you to see it for the sine and the cosine uh, functions, which uh, you know do, do nice wheels. And the idea is that um, you're going to take the exponential uh, function x of t equal e to the t, which is the red curve uh, here, and you're going to approximate of that um, curve by first one, so that point is on the curve, but also one plus t, okay, one plus a line, there's the f uh, first uh, approximation uh, that will carry you a little bit outside of that point, you see, before it, it deviates from the curve, plus uh, a parabola, that's the next thing in this series, you see. Uh, the quadratic parabola, you see, well, it, it, it approximates a little bit more of the exponent before it peels off uh, from the red curve. And uh, the next one is a cubic, the little green thing there, it peels off uh, to one pixel right about in here, okay, and so forth. They, they all kind of uh, end up uh, kissing the exponential for a while and then peeling away. Uh, and that's what I'd like you to see. And the same thing is true on the other side, on the downside uh, of the uh, uh, independent variable t. Here's the cosine and the sine. Now I'm skipping over the derivation of their Taylor series, but I'm just going to assume that you've seen that, but you may not have seen how well each of these terms does at approximating say the cosine. Now the cosine is an even function. It has a symmetry uh, around the origin. Uh, so I am only going to be using the even, that is the symmetric polynomials around the origin, even powers of the independent variable t. But uh, that means uh, 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 the zeroth power, which is just the one that starts the cosine of the origin, but then the parabola, you see, is not a bad approximation, at least to one pixel, until about there or so. And it's definitely uh, uh, gone south, so to speak. And uh, the same is true uh, for the fourth power being added to that. The fourth power is this curve right here, and you see it does a nice job with its coefficient, of course, one half. Uh, of approximating the curve uh, out to about there, you see. So the parabola came off about there. The, the, the quartic is, is coming off by one pixel about there, okay? And so forth. The uh, sixth power comes off about there. It's always about the same distance between each order of uh, the series. 
And this goes on and on and on forever. The distances between the peel-off points. That you have to define them by what precision do you like at the moment. And if you're a computer graphics jock, you're going to want it within a pixel. If it's within a pixel, there's nothing to see uh, uh, from the difference between, say, this approximation here uh, to 12 or this approximation here to 8, which is what's been written here. It will uh, stick to the curve as far as you can see. But of course it isn't. Inside there with a microscope you can see that the 8th is uh, only right exactly there. So, so this is uh, you know, a little bit of lore of these uh, uh, series. This is what it makes it very unlikely that power perturbation series can close out uh, something that oscillates a lot. You hate having to get uh, just another one and then another one uh, at forever. And it doesn't improve uh, for the eye functions, which is the sign. So that, that's something I think is worth finding. And again, something I wouldn't have done by hand. Uh, we're very thankful for the silica on this one. It makes it very easy, just a few hours uh, work uh, at the most uh, to get on this. Now, <clears throat> have you done it the other way, right? The, have you looked at representing a parabola or a, or a using graph? Using Fourier analysis, using Fourier. you bet. And that's fun too, and we're going to do that later in Unit 4. Um, it's really uh, quite amazing, and of course you're probably familiar with the Gibbs phenomena, which yeah. makes it I mean, really tough on the functions that have bends in them, yeah. the infinities of slope. I think that most, a lot of people have already done constant functions using cosines or something like that, where you see the Gibbs phenomena. Yes. Yes. But I don't think it is as common an exercise to see people trying to represent a parabola or a cubic graph. Well, the thing we're interested in is taking various uh, functions that are defined by, by groups mm -hmm. and making them work, you see. And since those uh, group transformations are themselves exponentials, mm -hmm. and something I didn't mention, thank you for the question, is that we're going to be generalizing this whole business to spinners so that we can do things in three, actually four, dimensions. can't do everything that we could in two, but we can do a lot. And that'll be in unit four as well. Okay, um, here is um, something that uh, really freaked people out, I can imagine, in the uh, uh, 1500s or 1600s, um, and well, I would say in 1600s, you were supposed to know this if you were a, a, math, a mathematician, and that is that if you uh, take the banker's interest rate and make it an imaginary number, okay, and uh, we unfortunately have uh, during the savings and loan collapse, but I think also in the major collapse of 2008, uh, a lot of people that were doing uh, uh, imaginary uh, something or other with their with their banking, okay. Yeah. And the, what's really funny about this is if I put an I there, I get my accounts not to grow like they're supposed to, but to just wiggle, okay. And this breaks up into uh, an even wiggler and an odd wiggler. That is, it breaks up into a cosine, and then I times the sine. And that's our uh, Euler theorem that uh, is so important for getting complex numbers uh, off the uh, starting block, so to speak. So this Euler theorem is going to be behind just about everything we do. And the generalizations of it, where we have uh, spinner operators, uh, is also important because it will have uh, actually four uh, numbers here, not just two. But uh, real and imaginary is enough to get us started uh, with some interesting mechanics and field theory and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, this is the part of the uh, lecture that I wanted you to see. It's very elementary, but then it doesn't hurt to review elementary things looking at them from another point of view.
particularly a geometrical one. And the thing that I want to emphasize from the start that the answer is why do you use complex numbers in quantum theory? Well, quantum theory is about incredible wiggliness. Everything in quantum theory is waves uh, vibrating uh, at, at uh, different points in space and time. And uh, we use clocks to represent the phase space of those oscillators. And that's where the, uh, I would say that's the major uh, reason uh, for having uh, the complex numbers helping us, uh, having our wave functions have uh, two components, a real and an imaginary part. And basically, where is the functions and where is it going, how fast is it going, is indicated by the imagine, uh, imagination precedes reality by a quarter of a circle. Is, uh, uh, way I like to say that and uh, make fun of the uh, way businessmen now uh, uh, have uh, restricted our scientific uh, efforts. They have to get everything by a quarter so they can satisfy stockholders, right? Anyway, the cosine and sine that are part of that complex number are visualized and uh, most of the time, as you'll see, we're going to be having uh, time functions with a minus sign here because if you're up here with a positive velocity you've got to be going that way, you've got to be going toward higher values. Uh, so uh, our phasers and normal uh, mechanics uh, rotate with a clockwise sense. Uh, of course anti-things are the opposite but let's not get into that just yet. Okay now oscillator phase analysis, this is the thing that I uh, would answer first if you ask me what good are complex exponentials and I would say complex numbers provide automatic trigonometry so um, if you can't remember in an exam or something of it as a closed book and you aren't allowed to do anything but think uh, what is cosine a plus b and sine a plus b and believe me as you get older it's harder to remember things like that uh, so all you have to do is factor e to the i a plus b into e to the i a times e to the i b. Once you've done that, you say, then you can just rewrite uh, the uh, exponentials in uh, Cartesian form or vice versa in exponential form. So uh, what I've got here is e to the i a plus b. I haven't factored it yet. So I have a cosine a plus b, which I've indicated in green, and a sine of a plus b that goes with the imaginary part that I indicate uh, that way, and uh, in red. And uh, you can see here that I have a cosine of a plus i sine of a as the expansion of the single factors of the exponential. And we're going to play this game over again with spinners, except then they, they won't commute. But here they do. It doesn't matter. I would then get product of this and this, it's this, and then i squared, which is a minus, and the product of those two, I'm done. I've got my cosine of a plus b, and there's the trig identity, okay? So it's things like this that can save you uh, if you're having some trouble uh, on an exam uh, with some trigonometry, and there's lots of other things uh, that do this. Vector sums, cosine rules, all this kind of stuff is all easily available de novo on a blank sheet of paper. Uh, you can re quickly re-derive uh, the cosine law or the sine law or a bunch of other things that are much easier. Okay? And then as I've said already, uh, when we uh, talk about um, phaser clock with a minus sign, that's a real phase space. Uh, it's just that we've uh, scaled the oscillator phase, phase space. So this is uh, the uh, velocity divided by omega. So that you get a circle and not an ellipse. If you have a high omega, this would be an ellipse. If you had a low omega, it would be an ellipse this way. Uh, you'd like to have a circle, and that, that makes the arithmetic easier. So there are, you know, four, you can look at a complex number as its real and imaginary part, that's called the Cartesian components, or you can look at it in polar components, that is, its polar angles, its radius, which is called the amplitude, or modulus, 
and the uh, uh, argument uh, or phase angle, uh, which is the angle theta in this case, the minus omega t. Okay, so it's just stuff we're going to work with. And remember, always always have these conversion uh, things. This is basically what the polar coordinate to Cartesian conversion device on all of the mathematical calculators is doing this conversion. That's what it's for. But whenever you have to convert, uh, you use an arc tangent. But the arc tangent, that this is a failable thing. This is multi-value. Instead, you use a tan two. I've mentioned this already, it's worth mentioning again, that you then put in two values, y and x, uh, separately, and then you won't get in any trouble with what quadrant are you in uh, for your angle theta. Okay, now, this I also want to point out when it comes to talking about vectors and rotations. The effect of an e to the i phi, that's a typical complex number, but let's make it a complex number whose uh, modulus is 1. Operating on a general complex number, that has any uh, uh, modulus or angle, is the effect that you see uh, right here. That is, I have a real part, it's the cosine times x, there it is, and then I have more of that from these two uh, products right here. It's a minus sign on it. Now it's y and sine. And then the imaginary part has its part. Well, the way you'd write this out if you were doing this with uh, vector components and vector analysis is with a matrix that looks like this. And how do you see that? Well, you just rewrite this thing with a unit vector x, which is silent in the complex analysis, and that's another advantage of the complex analysis, is that you don't uh, put anything in front of the real part. You put an i in front of the imaginary part. The i is equivalent to a unit vector in the y direction. So we're going to play a game uh, from now on when we deal with vectors, is we're going to uh, see the vector in the way that you would do it by Josiah Willard Gibbs notation, and then the way you do it with complex notation. You see that and quaternion notation were all available at the end of the 1800s in math courses in Europe. And Gibbs brought back only a fraction of that mathematics, which led to the Gibbs notation. Uh, usually you put an I here and a J there, right? Well, those are the first two of Hamilton's quaternions, I, J, and K. And he brought the K home as well. And that's vector analysis, okay, the notation that we, we owe to uh, Josiah Willard Gibbs. They call it, sometimes I say this is the emasculation of the spinner operators. <laughs> uh, we'll talk more about that later. In any case, this is the matrix relation. There's that, there's that. Okay? So, and that's what happens geometrically. You apply this thing and it takes any vector and rotates it by phi. And you can see that easily with this notation, you see. A little more complicated for three dimensions, but we'll get to that. Okay, um, I want to make sure I have uh, one other thing that's not necessary. Complex, provided, complex products provide two things. When you do a complex product, you get two things out of it because it's two-dimensional. You first of all get the dot product, and then you get a peculiar one-dimensional cross product. <laughs> okay, how does that happen? Well, let's take two complex numbers and do their star product. Now, what is a star product? A star product is where the first factor is complex conjugated. So I write that. That just means turn all of the EYs down. Turn all of the I's down. Turn all of the I's anywhere in there uh, negative. That's all you do. And it's understood that these components are real, just like they would be in an ordinary vector analysis. Okay? So when I put this thing together, 
and we're going to do this trick several times before we're done with these two lectures. I put these guys together as a real part and an imaginary part. And you recognize this one immediately as the dot product in two dimensions. But this is the cross product in two dimensions. You don't usually think of cross product in two dimensions unless you imagine a Z, a big capital Z, that's perpendicular to the plane of the paper or the screen here. And really, it should have bars around it because this is just a number. But that's what we mean. Sometimes we'll leave all of that stuff off while we're doing our two-dimensional stuff, but it's important to remember uh, that's what we're dealing with here. Okay? So this imaginary part vector cross product but it's just the z component normal to our xy uh, plane. The dot product is just a two-dimensional dot product. This is sort of new to most people that haven't looked at uh, complex numbers in this way. But it's also a neat way to get uh, various uh, uh, identities like the, the cosine and sine sum or difference. Okay. Because if I take the dot product in polar form, you can see right away what's happening. I'm getting d minus a uh, angle. And then the, the uh, magnitude of these uh, vectors, which is the square root of the sum of their squares, uh, is uh, the radius, the, ma the magnitude of each of them being product. And I get a cosine and a sine, as I should. Uh, one of them being cross product, the other dot product. Okay. And you can take that thing into Cartesian form and see that it's xy minus yx that's uh, uh, showing up there uh, in that uh, cross bar. Okay? All right. Now, derivatives. This is where it gets a little bit squirrely. But it, by twisting it a little bit, we get something that's really quite uh, powerful. A complex derivative, that's a d, d, z, d, z, this kind of thing, or maybe this kind of thing. We have to be clear about that. A complex derivative contains, in its real part, the divergence, and in its imaginary part, the curl. Now we're talking about a whole vector field. And that's what we're going to talk about for most of the rest of today's and part of, of uh, Thursday's lecture. But here's the thing you have to do. You have to sort of work the chain, the chain rule. We have two, two variables here, x and y, or z and z star. They're independent variables. You're used to these being independent variables, but it's a little hard to stretch your mind is to imagine that z and z star are independent. But they are, because there is a one-to-one -one and onto a transformation between them. This is it right here. Okay. It's kind of what we uh, showed before. When we the Cartesian, the polar. But um, the idea is that a derivative with respect to z is going to have two parts if you think of the independent variables x and y. So what I need is I need to know what is the Jacobian of the transformation in two dimensions. That is the, the partial of x with respect to z, the partial of y with respect to z, and dear me, we have lost our uh, building power here. Um, we can hope that it comes back, but uh, we may be in a little bit of trouble here. Certainly with regard to uh, showing uh, the uh, uh, now blank screen. Somebody's experiment is... <laughs> yeah, somebody turned on the uh, uh, laser water pump when it was uh, not... Uh, we, can, uh, we can just... I guess uh, 